I'm Nora Morgan, but I was Nora Allen, and uh, I was born in a co little cottage in Newton Purcell in 1928, and uh, I have three brothers, mm -hmm. uh, older than myself. Father came from Fringford Mill, yeah. but my mother was a London person. Her father had been born in Heath. But he'd gone to London and he worked on the railway for many years. Uh -huh. And my grandmother was an Irish nurse. Her name was Lynch. My no. grandfather lived at the mill because yes. he bought that in 1914. Right. And uh, there were about ten acres with it then. There yes. was a field which was almost seven and about mm -hmm. three at the back and the orchard. And uh, he used to keep... Um, uh, uh, cattle and pigs, but he also used to rent property from one of the farmers in the village mm. here, and he used to do ploughing and uh, and planting yeah. so that he could grind for his own animals. You see, yes. he used to do um, grinding for almost all the farmers around here. They all knew Tommy Allen. What they actually did was to shut the top sluice down, bring all the water down here, then when it was sufficiently deep, uh, they would open up the sluice and, and put a board across. There were two posts here, and they put a big board there. And then they filled all of this part with water yes. from the mill. Yeah. And when it was very deep, they could pop the sheep over the top, and it was so deep that they didn't break their legs, you see, when they dropped yeah. them in. And they used to get them to go under uh, with posts. They had um, long sticks, because I remember Mum saying she did it with somebody from one of the nearby farms. Push them in. And they used to get the sheep underneath there and get them to run up the slope on the other side and put them into other pens. They were just cheap yeah. washing. They yeah. weren't dipping. Yeah. It wasn't a poison, it was just a wash. My grandfather bought the cottage at the end of the row in Fringford. Yeah. And uh, he, he, I can remember him coming in and sitting in the chair and he says, I bought that house, because we knew it was for sale. And so Mum said, yes, Dad. And then I've, I don't know what the discussions were that went on, but uh, he offered it first to Mrs. Golden, who of course was the eldest sister, and she didn't want it. So um, Mum said she would come to Fringford and live in it. So we transported to Fringford. I and uh, I went, to, I remember going to school on the Monday, uh, on the Monday I went to school for the first time and, and on the Tuesday the teacher was filling in the forms. So she said, where did I come from and when was my birthday? And I said, oh, today. So it was the 16th of February in which we moved. <laughs> uh, and that was when I was nine. When I was... Um, older, I decided I wanted to be a teacher. So uh, I hadn't been to the grammar school because of course in those days it was a question of how many of you were going and if there was a lot of boys taking it then not many boys got in because they had a balance of boys and girls mm -hmm. and if there was a whole lot of girls going then the boys would all get in and only some of the girls. Oh. And uh, so I didn't go to the grammar school, but uh, when I was 14, I decided I was going to teach. And with two other, there were two other girls at the same time. And uh, we were, the head teacher at that time had been a London head. And he came here during the war. And he said, oh, well, I'll teach you how to be a teacher, you see, to each of us. And we were what they then called supplementaries, which were unqualified in any way. And uh, we used to teach alongside another teacher, You'd, as an apprentice, really. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later on, uh, he went away, he left, and uh, another head came. And his wife had been a teacher too. And she said, oh, I think it's such a shame that you hang about here doing this, because I think you could do some teaching. So she wrote to the person, at the, the principal of one of the colleges in London, 
who had been her lecturer in biology when she had uh, been in college herself. So she wrote to Miss Council and Miss Council said, tell your student to fill in a form in the normal way. So I did. And then they sent, at that time I was teaching at Stoke Line, and uh, they said uh, she has to take these examinations. So I took two papers uh, sitting in the classroom on my own, and the other teacher took all the children. And then that was sent away, so I was sent for an interview. And I went to London for an interview, and uh, then at the end of the interview, the, head, the principal said, I, you'll have to take two more papers. So I took two more papers that afternoon, and uh, on the strength of those four papers, I was accepted as a student in college. And, uh, and I, I, everything was the same as everybody else then, and, and so I just took the exams at the end and everything, and that was where I qualified. My grandfather used to um, plant the fields, he would harvest it. He used to do all the harvesting things himself, he'd get the casual labour to help him, but I mean, he didn't employ anybody as such except for my father. And. Uh, People always used to say, there were various people in the village whom he knew he could ask and they would always come. And they would bring the stuff up from the fields and build the ricks in the rickyard. And uh, then when there were things like beans or there was corn to thresh, they would bring in the threshing machine and they would just thresh it out and the corn, of course, as you know, the corn comes out one end and the, cor the um, <coughs> straw comes out at the other and the straw was put into ricks again because it was used for bedding for the animals and, uh, and the corn or beans, whichever, were taken in sacks to put in the mill and, uh, uh, and then they would be either, if they were beans, they would be crushed or if they were if it was corn, it would be ground. And uh, I can remember s s being in the mill and pulling on the cord sometimes to help to take the, s the sacks up because you would put a chain around the top of the sack and pull on the cord and it would take a sack straight up to the top of the mill and then it would be emptied into the hopper and it would go through the, into the next, um, into the next uh, story, I suppose you could call it, the one down. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would go through the, uh, through the, the mill um, stones and be ground and then fall down into the hopper in the bottom. And uh, then it would be taken, uh, there would be sacks fixed on something. And uh, you would shovel the, the, uh, um, the meal, which then had come down, into the sacks. And if it was grandfather's, it would put in one place. If it was Mr. Somebody's, it would be put in another. And if it was belonging to such and such up the road, it would went, went somewhere else. And then they would come and collect their grinding after so many days, you see. But, of course, grinding only took place in the earlier part of the year because that was what the corn was threshed in sort of October-ish. And then people from then until about March would, uh, would send their stuff to be um, uh, threshed. And, and then um, my father would leave the mill and he was paid a retainer of 30 shillings a week for the summer time. And then when he came back again in September, October to take the threshing machine out again, he would then be paid three pounds a week, which was quite a lot in those days, if you think. Mm. But my father, my grandfather, only charged the same amount when he retired in 1946 for the, the uh, crushing or the grinding that he ch charged when he went there in 1914. He never, ever charged more. <laughs> I've seen the booklets, uh, book, books that he put them all down in, so I do know that's true. Mm. Threepence, it was threepence a quarter, I think, that they used to charge for uh, um, crushing, and uh, sixpence for grinding. I think that's what it was. <laughs>